Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. I received this email. Is blood to the horse's bridle part of the sixth seal? I believe so. That's my answer. I was under the impression this verse was fulfilled. Why? I uh, had emailed you years ago about it following a lifetime teaching. I have to check my recordings. I don't know what you mean by lifetime teachings. I'm assuming that's something you saw somewhere else. So when you write to me and you let me know these things, you have to be a little bit more specific or else I really don't know what you're referring to. I'm not sure if lifetime teaching is somebody else that's teaching on the subject or it's something you watched on TV or something that you read. So be specific. And the rest of the email goes like this, Revelation 14, 20. And the winepress was thrown outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles for a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Am I correct in understanding this was fulfilled in 1099? The historian's words that of, that of Raymond of Aguilar's Quote, piles of head, hands, and feet were to be seen. It was necessary to pick one's way over the bodies of men and horses. Men rode in blood up to their knees and bridle reins. Well, let's expand on that a little bit more. This is in reference to the siege of Jerusalem, by the way, which right there should be your first clue why this verse does not apply to this 1099 event. I'm going to read you something. When a breach in the city was reached on 15th of July, the army was able to gain a foothold into the city. The scale of the slaughter there impressed even hardened veterans of the campaign who recalled the area steaming with blood that reached to the killer's ankles. Raymond of Aguilar's restored, restored to the language of the Book of Revelation in describing the Christian knights in front of the Alusk Mosque wading through blood up to their horses' knees. There's no way that could have been physically possible unless something supernaturally happened. That's number one. Let me continue. Before we made this assault on the city, the bishops and priests persuaded all by exhorting and preaching to honor the Lord by marching around Jerusalem in a great procession and to prepare for battle by prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Let me jump forward here because I don't want to dwell too long on this. After difficult in deadly siege that lasted, that lasted more than a month, the First Crusade breached the walls of Jerusalem and captured the city. According to the customs of war, adhered to by Muslims and Christians alike, the city and all of its inhabitants were at the mercy of the conquerors. There can be no doubt that the conquest of Jerusalem in July 1099 was a bloody affair. The eyewitnesses as well as contemporary writers made it clear in their respective writings. But at least in the first century after the events, no one suggested that the streets of Jerusalem ran with blood at any level. Whether or not these activities actually took place, the emphasis placed in the primary sources from the Crusades focused on the apocalyptic aspect of the successful siege. The city of God, the kingdom of heaven, was liberated from the rule of unbelievers. Well, it didn't stay that way, did it? That's another problem, especially when you get to Revelation 14.20. Let me skip along. The First Crusade accomplished more than what might be considered possible. 
beyond all hope and measure, achieve what may be considered the near impossibility of conquering and taking Jerusalem. And when the chroniclers and those who white witnessed the events began to write of what they took part in, many described it in dramatic and highly religious language. The influence cycle at the siege of Antioch and, Jer and Jerusalem was clear. Dios la Volt, D-U-S, second word L-O, Volt, V-U-L-T, or God's divine plan on earth. In their eyes and hearts was accomplished when the crusading army's banners were held over Jerusalem walls and citadels. With the capture and establish again of the King of God on earth in Jerusalem, this act of particular faith would not hasten God's plan for the final judgment of all the earth. Now that just gives you a very brief account of what happened in 1099. But throughout the region of the Jordan Valley, the scriptures read that the blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle. 1,600 furlongs, about 184 miles. Now, I want you to put that map and leave that map up there the whole time. Put me in a corner somewhere, if you can. And let's go back to verse 20 in Revelation 14 and read that again. And the winepress was thrown in without the city. Without the city. Circle, circle the word without. In the Greek it means away or outside the city. So if the city is referring to Jerusalem, which I believe it is, this event in 1099 would disqualify it from being associated with Revelation 14.20. Because that event happened within the city. Yes, it first started outside the city, if you want to get into all the history of that event, but the major butchering and slaughtering that went on happened within the city. In Revelation here, it's saying without, when the Greek is away or outside or out of the city. So that's another problem. Let me read you something else. And the reason why I think it was a good email is because it allows you one, one more time to refresh your memories what are some of the things that we've covered before in the past, especially when I was teaching on Gog and Magog. Concerning the wine press, running with blood. Additional information indicating that the great end times battle takes place at Mount Hermon and Zion. And of course, this comes from Revelation 14, both 19 and 20. We read 20, but let's read 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Revelation 14 and 19:20 we just read refers to the great winepress of the wrath of God, describing that on the day of judgment, the harvest in this winepress will be throttled, so that the blood will come out of the winepress, even to the height of the horse's bridles. How is that possible? That's a lot of blood. And we know there's going to be a lot of people. In this general area that you see in this map, especially the northern part of this map, which I believe where this battle will begin. That's a lot of blood. Mind-blowing. People think you're crazy. If you preach it, like, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen, but blood's going to be at, at the height level of the horse's bridle. Okay. Let's see how possibly that can happen. 
and this will happen by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a lot. Revelation 19, 15 explains that Jesus on the day of his return comes dressed for battle to thread, thread at the winepress of the fairness and the wrath of the Almighty God. Now, if the battles that take place in the mountains, which where I believe will begin on Mount Hermon, then the winepress should be nearby. Now, turn your Bibles quickly. If you don't have time to turn there quickly, just write all this stuff down, these verses, and then you can review them later. But if you can, 30, Ezekiel chapter 39, verse, let's see if I can find them quickly. Verse 17, let's just start at verse 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feather fowl and to every beast of the field, Assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on, the, every, on every side to my sacrifice. Better translation to my slaughter. That I do s s sacrifice for you, or slaughter for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains. Where? Upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, and bullocks, and all them fatlings of Basham. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed <coughs> excuse me, for you. Where? Beginning at Mount Hermon. Which means that winepress has to be nearby. The physical expression or representation of this wine press must be the hula basin that lies below Mount Hermon. You can see there on that map. Let me pull up mine because I can't see that far away from the screen. I'll follow along with you. If you look at the map, You'll see Mount Hermon there on the top of that map, and then you see Sisera, Hulapai, the headwaters of the Jordan River. Then you see Dan, and right below Dan you see Lake Hula Basin. You got that? So the physical expression or representation of the wine press must be in the Hula Basin that lies below Mount Hermon. Now, let's go to Joel in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 3. Verse 11. Let's begin there. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. This has not happened yet. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near, the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, between, well, it's moving down from Mount Hermon, one encounters the upper valley of the Jordan River and the Hula Basin, which was already we already looked at. The Hula Basin is about 5 kilometers by 15 kilometers by 1 kilometer. Depression that the Jordan River flows through. Ancient lava flows once blocked the Jordan Valley in the Hula area and dammed up the river within this depressed area, creating a rough bowl-shaped area. However, in time the Jordan River cut through the lava dam and continued its rapidly Descending journey to the south. The Hebrew word Jordan means descends. Descends. Since ancient times, a small lake called Hula Lake has been fed by the waters that drain into this basin. 
which is likened to a wine press in Revelation 14. From Hula Lake, the Jordan River continues to flow south until it enters, then flows into the Sea of Galilee. After it emerges from the Sea of Galilee, it continues on until it ultimately reaches the Dead Sea. In addition to the streams that flow down snow-capped Mount Hermon, there is a second way for blood spilled on Mount Hermon to get into the wine press. So there's one way, now let's read about the second way. Because of its geology, limestone with hollow pockets from water percolation, known as karst, K-A-R-S-T, Mount Hermon has significant underground drainage, and the basin that lies at the foot of Mount Hermon would in part drain away the blood if vast quantities of it were spilled on the mountain. In fact, a portion of the rainfall and snow melt that occur on Mount Hermon seeps through the ground, emerging from a spring at the foot of Mount Hermon. The waters that flow out of this spring and the streams that run down Mount Hermon constitute the headwaters of the Jordan River. Jordan River water is the lifeblood of Israel and it begins at Mount Hermon, passes through the basin or winepress and heads south, eventually emptying into the Dead Sea, the lowest place on the surface of our planet. I believe the blood will flow all the way down to the Dead Sea and at that time it's already began or, or will begin to be the lake of the fire. When grapes are crushed in the wine press, the release liquid drains out of a pipe at the bottom of the wine press. The section of the Jordan River that emerges from the basin or wine press below Mount Hermon can be likened to this drainage pipe. So from this wine press like basin, blood and water would then flow out into the Jordan River, one of the very few waterways in Israel whose waters can reach the height of a horse's bridle as also called for in Revelation 14 verses 19 and 20. I'll read that to you again slower. So, when th so from this wine press, like basin, blood and water would then flow out into the Jordan River, one of the very few waterways in Israel whose waters can reach the height of the horse's bridle as also called for in Revelation 14, verses 19 and 20. Revelation 14, 19 and 20 says that these blood-stained waters are to flow for a total distance of 1,600 Hebrew furlongs, La furlongs or about 142 no, 184, excuse me, miles. You look at the map, what do you see there? From the headwaters of Jordan to Basra, which I'll get to in a minute, 184 miles. If you want to get technical, which this map doesn't show, it'd be closer to 183.7 miles. Coincidence? I don't think so. The distance from the spring at Mount Hermon and the beginning of the Jordan River down to the Dead Sea and then continues southeast up to the river Zered, Z-E-R-E-D, with headwaters near Basra, B-O-Z-R-A-H, is about 1,600 Hebrew furlongs. While the river Zered flows from southeast to northwest, an earthquake or impact generator river wave could easily cause waters to go up Zered and flow the entire 1600 furlong length of this interconnected water system. Or blood could enter the river Zered near the mountain area of Basra and flow northwest into the Dead Sea. So one way or another, blood could run as high as the horse's bridle for a total distance of 1600 Furlongs, the only interconnected water system in Israel that could, be, could let blood flow for a distance of 1,600 Hebrew furlongs is the Jordan River slash Dead Sea slash River Zerig Jack. Along this 1,600 furlong 
drainage track. We have the Battle of the Mountains at Herman, the wine press, that is, the bowl shaped hula basin, south of the mountains, the blood running south and high as the horses bridle down the Jordan River into the Dead Sea, and the slaughter in the mountains near Boswell, discharging blood stained water running down the River Zered into the Dead Sea. These parallels are haunting. Now, Revelation 19.13, let's read that. Let's go back to Revelation 19.13. Write these down. What, how's that read? It reads, And he, he being Jesus, was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of of God. <clears throat> Revelation 19.13 has Jesus appearing clothed with a vesture tip, di excuse me, dipped in blood. And Revelation 19.15 tells how he has threaded the winepress. Isaiah 34.6 says that the Lord hath a sacrifice at Basra. Well, let's read that. Let's go back to Isaiah 63. Verse, no, let's not go to 63. Let's go to 34 first. Isaiah 34, verse 6. How's that read? The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. And with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, the Lord had a sacrifice in Basra. And a great slaughter in the land of Indumia. And a parallel passage would be Isaiah 63. Let's go there quickly and read through. Verse 1. Let's just start with verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Indumia with thy garments from Basra, that this glorious, that this that his, is glorious in his peril, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness mighty to save, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that threaded in the wine vat. I have thrown the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will threaten them into my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my remnant. For the day of vengeance is, my, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. All this still needs yet to happen. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation to me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will Tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury and I'll bring down their strength to the earth. Isaiah 34, Lord had a sacrifice at Basra. Isaiah 63, ask who's coming from Basra with garments like he has thrown in the winepress. And then one more, Jeremiah 49. Hopefully you wrote all these down, you can go back and read them at a slower pace to absorb all this. Jeremiah 49, 22 reads, Behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle, and spread his wings over Basra. And at that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. <clears throat> Jeremiah 49.22 tells the Lord flying like an eagle over Basra. So it seems that the main battle site of Mount Zion on Mount Hermon, another name for it by the way, everybody automatically just thinks Jerusalem, Jesus throws the winepress 
the bowl-like area at the foot of the mountains where the invading armies have assembled. From Mount Simon at Mount Hermon, Jesus is then to lead south to the mountainous area near Basra, all the way down that map, and effect another bloody slaughter. So you have a slaughtering that's going to take place in the north parts of the area of Mount Hermon, all the way to the southern parts below the Dead Sea. Jesus is going to lead in both areas. He will have victory in both areas. A bloody slaughter is going to happen in both areas. That is why Isaiah 63, the verses we read 1 through 5, and Jeremiah 49, 22, tells of Jesus flying like an eagle coming from Basra. How does that happen? I don't know. I could probably have fun with it and guess how it might take place. But that's not important for this particular teaching. Jesus flying like an eel coming from Basra with garments already stained with blood as if he had thrown the wine press. Presumably, he is seen flying like an eagle on his way to effect a third bloody slaughter. In Isaiah 31, I mean, let's read the, let's go, let's go to Isaiah 31. It's just, we have time. Isaiah 31, verse 4. For thus... Say it, hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as a lion the young lion ro roaring on his prey, with the multitude of shepherds is called forth against him. He will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself. For the noise of them, so shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion, and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. And then you go back to Jeremiah 48. It reads, <clears throat> verse 40, For thus said the Lord, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle, and shall spread his wings over Moab. Still in the Indomia area. Now, Jesus is headed south to the mountains near Basra, a bloody slaughter. We see Jesus flying like an eagle, coming from Basra, with his garments already stained with blood. Then, he is seen flying like an eagle on his way to effect a third bloody slaughter. What we just read, this time at a smaller wine press called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Go to Joel. Joel chapter 3, verse 11. Let's read this again. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. There caused the mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, and the vats overflow, for the weakness is, is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall be draw their shining. Now this valley of Jehoshaphat, which I believe is around Jerusalem, will take place. The multitudes in the value decision referred to here in Joel chapter 3 could also possibly be a much larger valley beneath Mount Hermon or below Mount Hermon where possibly a main battle takes place. 
I'm just giving you general references where battles are going to take place. I believe, according to the scriptures that we read, there's going to be three battles take place. One at the northern part of Israel's present day borders to the southern part below the Dead Sea and then maybe a final battle in around the Valley of Jehoshaphat, either around Jerusalem or could be below Mount Hermon. That third battle is still in question where that might take place. But nevertheless, these battles are going to happen. In Isaiah 31, verse 4 and 5, it says, The Lord Almighty will come down and do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Now Isaiah 31, verse 4 and 5 in the Septuagint says, So the Lord of hosts, hosts shall descend to fight upon my, Mount Zion, there, it says, Mount Hermon, even upon her mountains. So, that's why there's some question where at least one of these battles take place. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is not certain, but what's certain, these battles will take place. The Valley of Decision will not be an outcome that the ones that come against the Lord going to be a pleasant one. In fact, none of their blood, but the rest of them will wind up, I believe, either flowing in or place it, place, it be placed in the lake of fire. When all said is all is said and done. He will have the great victory. Jesus will come. He will judge in the value decision. But again, as his word promise, fighting for Israel. So, do I believe that the battle in 1099 between the Crusaders and the Muslims, what was prophesied in Revelation 14? No. Do I believe Raymond of Aguilar was creative in his language, tried to identify that particular verse that we read in Revelation 14 with the situation he saw on the ground? Yes. But as I, like I said earlier, there's problems with it. There's problems with it. And just to remind you, what they saw in the city has nothing to do with what's going to happen without the city or on the outside of the city or away from the city. Now Jesus will come. And I believe, and I've mentioned this before in past teachings, He will breach that eastern wall. Closure and enter in as a conquering king. There's still a lot to cover. I had to get to the vials. There's so many things in the book of Revelation we still haven't covered. But hopefully as I keep piecemealing this, you can start making the connections, connect the dots, and hopefully more and more of this will be understandable according to thus say the word of the Lord. If you got it, I want to hear from you. If you don't, listen to it again. Either way, I want to hear from you. Now it's your turn to talk to me. Play a song.